Good morning, everyone. As we gather, we acknowledge with gratitude that the land upon which we reside is Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. May the Creator grant healing and reconciliation to the whole community. Our thanks to Gillian for that wonderful introduction to a celebration of the feast of St. Luke, evangelist and physician. We gather in your presence, O oh God. In our need and bringing with us the needs of the world. We come to you, for you come to us in Jesus. And you know what human life is like. We come with our faith and with our doubts. We come with our hopes and with our fears. We come as we are, because you have invited us. And you have promised never to turn us away. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Loving God, we come as those seeking your healing, your strength and your love. You know us and understand who we are. You know what troubles and puzzles us, what makes us smile and what makes us sad. You listen to our questions and our prayers. You know the people we love and the ones we struggle with. Sometimes we hurt others. Sometimes we hurt ourselves. So we bring our own hurt, asking for your healing. We bring the hurt we have caused others, asking for your forgiveness. Listen to these words of Jesus, words that we can trust. I love you. Don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. I will be with you always. Write these words in our hearts, God. Let them take root in our lives. Amen. A reading from Sirach. Honor physicians for their services, for the Lord created them. For their gift of healing comes from the Most High, and they are rewarded by the King. The skills of physicians make them distinguished, and in the presence of the great they are admired. The Lord created medicines out of the earth, and the sensible will not despise them. And he gave skill to human beings that he might be glorified in his marvelous works. By them the physician heals and takes away pain. The pharmacist makes a mixture from them. God's works will never be finished, and from him health spreads over all the earth. My child, when you are ill, do not delay, but pray to the Lord. He will heal you. Give up your faults and direct your hands rightly and cleanse your heart from all sin. Then give the physician his place. For the Lord created him or her. Do not let him leave you, for you need him. There may come a time when recovery lies in the hands of physicians, for they too pray to the Lord that he will grant them success in diagnosis and in healing for the sake of preserving life. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. A reading from the temporary tradition, All Healing is of God by George MacLeod. Christ came neither to save souls nor to save bodies. He came to save people. Thus, our whole ministry is one of healing, making the crooked places straight in international issues, in social issues, and in issues of justice. In Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. He is the at one -ment. And as of the larger, so of the less. Christ makes crooked people straight. As in the body politic, so in the human body. He makes straight, here the crooked mind, and there the crooked body, and most often the crooked mind body. There is no such thing as Christian healing over against healing. All healing is of God, and the one who walks again after penicillin is just as much divinely healed as the one who walks again after a service of laying on of hands. We have no divine repository where religious things happen over against a hospital where so-called merely physical things happen. Psalm 147. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor God with praise. 
The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem and gathers the exiles of Israel. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord counts the number of stars and calls them by their names. The Lord, great is our God and mighty in power. There is no limit to the wisdom of God. God lifts up the lowly but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. The Lord covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth, making grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. The Lord provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. The Lord is not impressed by the might of a horse and has no pleasure in human strength, but finds pleasure in those who fear God, in those who await the gracious favor of the Lord. Glory to God, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be. Amen. As our canticle this morning, we have a prayer entitled Acceptance. And I would commend this prayer to any and all of us as one to use in our own personal time of need. Its attitude of openness and receptivity is exactly what God needs from us to enable us to receive the gift of healing. May I remember, dear God, that I belong in your arms. It is there that I am healed and there that I am whole. May all impurities be cast from my mind, my heart and body. May every fiber of my being be filled with your light. May my body and soul radiate your love. You are my divine physician. In you, I trust. I accept your purpose for me. I accept your healing. I accept your love. I accept myself. Amen. <coughs> A reading from the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through, through all, all the surrounding, surrounding country. country. He, began he began to teach in their, in their synagogues, synagogues and was, and was praised, praised by, everyone. by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. May we become aware of your healing presence in our midst, O oh God. May we hear the still small voice in the depths of our hearts. May your word indwell us and fill us with your Holy Spirit as we reflect on the written word during this time. Amen. 
Now is a very challenging time to work in healthcare. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has pressured the systems in way the system in ways few in healthcare have ever experienced. Since I've been working at St. Paul's Hospital again, I've regularly heard stories of exhaustion, frustration, and anger from many other professionals. A spiritual care colleague told me of how she recently went into the intensive care unit. She observed how tired one of the nurses looked and shared this observation with the nurse. The nurse started crying. Several other nurses gathered round and they all shared a lot of tears together. The last time I was in the intensive care unit, the nurse I was talking with told me she was moving on to work in another part of the hospital. She was looking forward to getting away from having to treat people who were so sick with COVID. From her perspective, this illness was totally preventable simply by receiving a vaccine. And this was months before things were as bad as they are now. Stories like these are increasingly common in healthcare right now. Perhaps it is not surprising that healthcare professionals have a concept that describes what many of them are experiencing moral distress. According to most definitions, moral distress happens when a person knows the right thing to do, but is prevented from doing so by situations and pressures beyond their control. For many healthcare professionals, they know exactly what to do. From their perspectives, people need to get vaccinated, and the government needs to do more to prevent the spread of this terrifying disease. But, as we all know, our provincial government has been reluctant to mandate masking and other restrictions. The government is also very reluctant to give the public concrete incentives to get vaccinated. For many working in healthcare, this is very distressing. Those who ought to be supporting them, ensuring the system can continue to function properly, have completely disappeared from the public eye. This has left many healthcare professionals feeling isolated, alone, and unsupported, especially by those who are supposedly there to help them. It is therefore not surprising that a recent survey of Saskatchewan nurses indicated 45% of them considered leaving their profession due to their experiences during this pandemic. Now, the fact that public discourse is increasingly polarized does nothing to ease the distress of many in healthcare. While it is debatable how widely people share extreme anti-vaccination or conspiracy theory views, the fact these perspectives are commonly reported in the media gives many in healthcare the sense they are fighting a losing battle. Social media, the news media, and many other kinds of public media thrive on sensation and extremes. But in a time when good information is needed to combat a significant challenge to public health and well-being, many experience these media as only increasing their feelings of distress and frustration. Everyone I've spoken to is tired. Everyone I know wants this pandemic to be over. But in our environment where truth is politicized and the media flourish by creating discord and strife, it's hard not to believe this time has become impossible. Thankfully, today's gospel offers a way out. The words Jesus reads from Isaiah today are well known. They are hope-filled, beautiful words, promising the restoration of homes lost a generation ago. The feelings of exile and alienation behind these words are familiar to us. For many of us, the world has become unfamiliar. The world we grew up in does not exist anymore. The strife and conflict all around us grind us down. Finding times away from the news, expressing our love for family and friends, these moments recharge us. But then, when we're reminded of the state of the world, it's difficult not to feel beaten down again. What an incredible picture Isaiah's words paint for us then. Freedom, liberation, release from captivity, all of us yearn for these things. Oh, to go out in public again without wearing a mask. 
to feel free simply to enjoy the company of friends and family without having to worry about someone's vaccination status. These are the cries of our times. These are what we all deeply desire, to be free and to enjoy life as it was, for life to be normal again. For Jesus to say in today's gospel then, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. How could we, like the people in the synagogue, not be moved? We yearn for this liberation. We beg for it. But part of us might also ask, really? When I go away from this place, I'm still going to have to wear my mask. I'm still going to have an uncomfortable conversation about someone's vaccination status. It's nice you've said this, Jesus, but where's the proof? But then, in the verses immediately following our reading, Jesus does this crazy thing. He deliberately goes out of his way to get the people in the synagogue angry with him. Remember, all this was happening in Jesus' hometown. The people there knew him. Luke hints they were impressed that Jesus, whom they had known his entire life, was saying such wonderful things. But then Jesus essentially tells them, you don't really know me. You think you know me because you know my family? Well, in reality, you don't. You think I'm going to heal people like here like I did around the lake in Capernaum? Well, I'm not, because you can't recognize me for who I really am. The people in the synagogue then drive Jesus outside in the hope of throwing him off a cliff. But Jesus disappears into the crowd and makes his way elsewhere. I could say a lot about this story, but one thing is clear. This seems a funny way for Jesus to get people support. If Jesus goes out of his way to anger and alienate those closest to him, what does this mean about his mission? How could he say in one breath a promise is fulfilled, yet in the next enrage the people to the point they want to kill him? This is a strange way to bring comfort and love. But what if Jesus' confrontation with his hometown was central to his message? What if he spoke truly when he said they didn't know him? What if to free them he had to demonstrate forcefully that their previous relationships with him had little to no bearing on who he really was. What a strange and disturbing message for Jesus to proclaim. What a disturbing and distressing message for Jesus' friends and family to receive. And how to make sense of it in our own times. By now, most of us know about the power of stereotypes. For those who have studied them, Stereotypes are ideas about people based on some of their defining characteristics. The result is people are often stereotyped according to their race, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, gender, or sexuality. Though it is true people in specific groups often do share some characteristics, we also know how stereotypes can become harmful. They can justify discrimination and social division instead of building community and connection. Now, it's clear Jesus wasn't being stereotyped in today's gospel. After all, he belonged to the same group as the people he was speaking to. Yet it's also clear those in the synagogue thought they knew Jesus in specific ways. But these obviously weren't consistent with the, with the way Jesus knew himself. For Jesus to successfully embody his message then, he had to step outside his hometown's expectations of him. He had to demonstrate there was a lot more to him than what they thought they knew, even though he had lived among them for most of his earthly life. In other words, Jesus had to show his hometown who he really was. To do this, he had to show them their understandings of him to that point were wrong. Now, most of us, myself included, have specific understandings of healthcare professionals. We believe they are deeply committed to caring for people, no matter the pressures, no matter the circumstances. In many cases, this is true. 
But to what extent do these understandings limit our ability to see healthcare professionals in all their humanness? Do these understandings limit our capacity to receive the frustration, anger, and exhaustion many in healthcare are experiencing right now? We could ask the same question about people who do not share our views regarding vaccinations or restrictions on public movements and indoor gatherings. To what extent do our understandings of these people limit our capacity to see them in all their humanness? Can we receive these people's fears, their frustrations, and their anger? Our faith teaches that the image of God and likeness of Christ can be found in all people, regardless of their beliefs, behaviors, or political views. How then can we see this and connect with it in absolutely everyone we encounter, especially in such polarized times as ours? I'm pretty sure I don't have all the answers to these questions, but I do wonder whether our hopes, fears, dreams, and apprehensions have something to do with it. All of us desire to have full and fulfilling lives. All of us want the best for our families, our children, and our grandchildren. We desire to be gainfully employed or to enjoy an engaged retirement. We all want our lives to mean something. But the pandemic has called all of this into question. The first few months were manageable. We all thought a short time of lockdown would be all that was needed to get us through it. But as two months turned into four months, then six months, then a year, then 19 months, all of us could say with the psalmist, how long must we suffer, O God? All of us have been in this together. None of us has been unaffected by it. And in this setting, the pain, suffering, and frustration we've all experienced have been a matter of degrees, not exclusive to one group or another. Even those who deny COVID's reality have been affected by the pandemic. Why else would they need to deny it? And so the pandemic has taught us something profound about our human frailty. If a single disease can have such global impact, what about our political and economic systems? What about our attitudes and actions? What about our daily choices about the products we purchase or how we fuel our vehicles? The call of today's gospel then is to step outside all the ideas that form our experiences and to be deeply confronted by the Christ in all people and in all creation. So long as we hold on to our ideas regarding how life ought to be, we miss the divinity already in all that is. Furthermore, when we pay attention to this divinity, we cannot help but realize we are always already in God's presence. Any person standing in front of me is therefore a bearer of the divine presence if only I take the time to notice it. My only possible response then to any person, regardless of whether we agree on various things or not, is attention, care, and compassion. Even though I may disagree with their politics, their behaviors, or their assessment of the pandemic, I cannot, help the I cannot escape the reality that in some strange way, this other person is bringing the Christ to me. This really is what Jesus revealed to humanity. This Messiah born in a stable, this Messiah executed like a thief, could easily have been passed over. But in his deep humanity, Jesus revealed God to all of us. Just so, all of us can receive God from those we might easily dismiss or pass by, if only we pay attention. So, today on this Feast of St. Luke, we acknowledge that healing comes when we see the Christ in all that is. We can receive God from healthcare workers, 
exhausted and beaten down. We can receive God from those who fear COVID so much that all they can do is deny it. We can receive God from all who suffer, regardless of whether we agree with them or not, because we know suffering too. As a result, we can hope and pray and yearn with all creation for restoration, because when we are bound together by the Christ's presence in everything, then our hopes and prayers and yearnings might have a greater chance of being fulfilled within our hearing. May we learn to receive the Christ in all, through all, and with all. And may the Christ restore all things in us, with us, and through us. Amen. An affirmation of faith. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, 
of water and earth, of human and creature. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree, a man of compassion, he died forsaken, he descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, people came to you when they were troubled or in pain. You listened to them, prayed with them, and brought healing and hope into their lives. Today, we bring into our minds and hold in God's presence those people and situations which have touched our hearts. Bless the heads that bow, the hands that touch, the hearts that hope. Bring healing, bring peace, we pray. We call upon you, O God, for, though, for through you all can be made whole. Hear us as we raise to heaven our concerns for the people of earth. We pray for Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Eritrea, and for those on the islands of Crete and Hawaii impacted by earthquakes. For the whole creation, we pray, bring healing, bring peace. In silence, we remember those who are victimized because of race, background, or history, because of gender, of sexuality, or just because they're different. For all, who suffer abuse, neglect, or exclusion. Oh God, bring healing, bring peace. We pray for those experiencing physical pain or who suffer silently and long for healing that human hands alone cannot offer. For those undergoing treatment, awaiting tests or diagnosis, we name before you Eduardo Ansaldo, Eugene Asali, Haley Ladd, Lisa Molner, and Michael Wright. Be near them, O oh God. Encourage and strengthen them. Bring healing, bring peace. Jesus, we remember how you cried at the death of your friend Lazarus, how you shared the grief of those who mourn. So we remember before you all who grieve dear ones, whether the loss is fresh or longstanding. Enfold in your love all who sorrow that they may find solace. Bring healing, bring peace. We pray for the church as an agent of healing, giving thanks for the power of community, the strength of faith, and the gifts of sacramental ministry to mediate your grace and care. Bless all who exercise these gifts and all in need of them. Lend tend your sick ones, O Christ, Rest your weary ones, bless your dying ones, cheer your goodness. And all for your love's sake, we pray. 
bring healing, bring peace. As your disciples learn to pray and lay hands upon others that they might be healed, may we also be faithful in our prayer for one another. We are grateful for those among us who pray when asked, for the prayer chain members and those of the prayer team for their faith and their love. Bless and encourage them that through their ministry, you might bring healing, bring peace. May your mind, O oh God, ever wiser than our own, search us deeply and open us to the truth that make for our healing. May your ears hear beneath our words our honest yearning. May, you feel, may your heart cherish us deeply, mending any brokenness and affirming our work. Bring healing, bring peace. Jesus, your hands are strong to hold and to heal, to wipe away tears and protect in danger. Protect all who care for our safety and in your holy work of healing in hospitals, nursing homes, counseling rooms, and around kitchen tables. We ask these things for the good of your world and in your strong name. To those who seek you, all who need you, to the world you cherish, bring healing, bring wholeness, bring peace. Amen. May the mind of God, ever wiser than our minds, search us deeply and open us to the truths that make for our healing. May the ears of God ever open to our prayers. Listen for us deeply and hear beneath our words, our honest yearnings. May the heart of God ever filled with costly love, cherish us deeply, mending any brokenness and affirming our worth. May God keep us company this day and bring us joy in the morning. Amen.
To the four corners of the world be peace, and on us gathered now, may the compassion of God rest to bless us and enfold us and those we love this day and always. Amen.